Today's guest directed the prelude to Axina and was a very good friend of Alec Peters before a very public falling out. Mr Christian Gossett joins me from Wellington on the other side of this. For three years, one website has aimed high, striving to be the best video podcast online, interviewing 24 sci-fi alumni, Australia's first astronaut, and producing a three-week road trip focusing on science in Australia. G'day, everyone, and welcome to Australia's capital, Canberra. Celebrating three years, this is the Trek Zone Spotlight. G'day everyone and welcome to a brand new set celebrating the third year of the Trek Zone Spotlight. I'm Matt Miller as always and joining me today is Mr Christian Gossett from the TV NZ Studios in Wellington. Christian, thanks so much for your time and welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. Good to be here. Now your first public comments were on the GNT show a couple of weeks ago and now you're joining us here on the Trek Zone Spotlight. Uh, back in 2012, even earlier, uh, Alec asked you to help him make a fan movie, uh, a, a spec movie even. Yes. Uh, what was your relationship like with him back then? Oh, it was great. Uh, it really was. We were close and he uh, came and uh, wanted me to help him learn all this stuff. Uh, when I shot my first short film, after another trip, a previous trip to Wellington, I came back uh, under the advisement of some very close friends here in Wellington that recommended I try my hand at live-action directing. <clears throat> um, having only previously directed animation and co-directed animation in the video game business, uh, and of course having been a graphic novelist since I was 19 years old, some Wellington filmmakers <clears throat> said, hey mate, you might want to try live-action directing. So it came back to Los Angeles, very excited, and uh, made a film. With uh, a, I talked to a producer friend of mine, uh, Jennifer Weberly, who's a professional producer, really amazing. And I said, hey, these really amazing people from, that I work with in Wellington said I should try this. What do I do? <laughs> and uh, She said, oh, it's great. Listen, my friends are about to go on hiatus. Uh, think of a story, one actor, one set, no production sound, and we'll see how you do. See how you handle a live action set. And we did. We shot over the weekend. It was a... Uh, this was 2009, and uh, the film went well. It went on to win awards, it played many festivals, and uh, went really well. Alec visited that set for, uh, came on, kind of checked it out. Um, he was just there as a visitor that time, but uh, that just lets you know how, uh, you know, we were close, and we <coughs> played a lot of Warhammer 40,000 together. Uh, not as much as I would have liked. I love that game, just don't have enough time to play as much as I'd like. And uh, he's quite, he was quite the devotee back in the day. And uh, so, you know, we were basically a couple of geese. We met at conventions. We'd talk. We'd go for a hike when he'd visit L.A. Uh, you know, we were, that was, it was good fun. And uh, when he asked me to help him learn uh, <clears throat> how one does what I was now doing, uh, making live action entertainment, I did everything I could to help out. Now, the two of you eventually got together to write and produce and direct the Prelude to Action R. We now know what Alex's intentions were, but what were yours? My intention was to guide him as a friend. He had come to me, asked for my help in kind of figuring this all out. I had first owned an intellectual property at 19 years old uh, in, a, in an anthology magazine called Tales of the Ninja Warriors, which the memory of which I'm still quite fond of. <laughs> And although it was a pretty silly story. <laughs> and uh, so I've been doing this a long time. I'd first been on set as a child, thanks to my father, who was a professional actor. And so uh, I, I knew quite a bit about this, and definitely more than him, who had never actually uh, taken part in professional entertainment. So that was my first intention, was to help my friend kind of make the leap and, and uh, hopefully succeed. And then another Kickstarter was launched and you raised $580,000 and that's sort of when things began to change, didn't they? Yes. Uh, let's go back a little bit. Uh, so um, some of my first advice to him was short form entertainment. I was really the first thing I said. I was very excited about a book I was reading at the time, Neil Gabler's book about the Disney brothers, Walt and Roy, <clears throat> and how they started and there was a fascinating, the fascinating thing about that story for me at the time was how short form had come back. Short form entertainment was huge at the dawn of film. 
and it had kind of gone away and then Pixar started to bring it back and then video games started to bring it back. Blizzard does amazing short films for their games. Uh, and then of course with YouTube and viral videos, short form had really come back. So because of his complete lack of experience, I advised short form entertainment and I used my own experience uh, <clears throat> for further justification. I said, listen man, if I, had, if I could redo my graphic novel series, The Red Star, um, I definitely would have if I could go back, I would do more, more frequent, shorter stories than the sweeping epics that my friends and I did. Uh, just because you, well, for many reasons, actually. Um, many, many great reasons to do that. And I advise that. And of course, uh, I sent him to, I, I told him that if he wants to do this, he should go to some screenwriting seminars to get an introduction. He went to Robert McKee as a result. I told him to take acting classes, he wanted to act in it. So I said, go to acting classes and don't just go to any acting class, go to you know, the kind of acting classes that professional working actors use uh, to stay sharp. And he did all that. And of course, he came back from the Robert McKee seminar very, very excited with a feature script. <laughs> I said, mate, what happened to the whole short form idea? But well, do you think then that Alec bit off more than he could chew? He was trying to write, produce, uh, and star in this feature. He went straight to a feature in, instead of trying something else. Uh, do you think that was maybe the first stumble? I, uh, I definitely advised him otherwise. And, uh, and fortunately, at that time, we were still close. He was listening. So instead of jumping right into the feature, even though he had a feature script uh, or the beginnings of one, um, he did listen and, and said, listen, we can break it down. We decided that it would be, we could at least break it down into smaller pieces and attempt one first so that he could learn, so that he could get on set and really feel what it's like to take something from the idea all the way to execution. So plans were set for uh, Prelude to Axanar. He had a, a great idea to do a, we were both, we, we are still both fans of military history. And he said, let's do a military documentary, but in the context of the Star Trek universe. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, when I was a child, I was raised on this great BBC series, The World at War. And it was a burned into my memory. In fact, when I look back at a lot of my work and the military themes in it, I can give a lot of credit to that amazing documentary uh, back then. I thought, oh, this is great. We'll do Star Trek meets World at War. And so he handed me a series of monologues that, uh, that I turned into a script. Um, it, what he submitted was monologues. There was a lot of, you know, for the, he's a first time writer having never done it professionally. So there were a lot of uh, just monologues, this page and a half of talking, lots of Trek kind of techno babble. Techno babble is awesome in its place. And Trek is, you know, the art of Trek is the art of techno babble, but this was just too much. And so I cut that down. I added the idea of there being star dates. I, uh, he had a narrator, but there was, the narrator was a one-off. I made the narrator a, a constant kind of interstitial that held the thing together because I'd seen World at War. And I kind of based the whole thing on World at War. And um, this became Prelude to Axanar. Well, first, we realized we had to raise money to do Prelude to Axanar. And I directed uh, a Kickstarter video. We shot it at Alex's apartment. And uh, it was very, very quick. Uh, one day, shot it very kind of haphazard, but we got it done. Richard Hatch was wonderful in it, as were all the other people who came on to sit in front of the camera and talk about how great this was going to be. And, uh, and we, were, we were off. So and things right. really developed from there. Uh, there was material shot, crowdfunding was made, uh, and then Alec made this decision to build a studio in, instead of rent one. And, and I believe that you and Rob Burnett uh, strongly disagreed with that decision. In fact, let's go back again. So the, the Kickstarter for Prelude goes very well. <clears throat> the fans were very excited about the idea of Richard Hatch as a Klingon and Kate Vernon and... Uh, Michael Hogan was advertised to be a part of it, uh, he, and he was. He left the production, unfortunately, because of a whole other thing I won't go into. Um, turns out he was wise to do so. But, um, <clears throat> but Gary Graham uh, was part of it. I mean, the, the, the fans really took to it. And, the, uh, and so we raised $100,000 uh, in the neighborhood. And the first place 
we the first thing we did was let's look for a place to shoot. Uh, I was looking for a place to shoot. I brought on a couple of line producers who were looking for places to shoot. The big thing about the place to shoot prelude was we needed to demonstrate to the ex established, famous, much beloved cast that we had assembled that we knew what they needed as talent, what they needed to work, and how they needed to be managed and taken care of. That was very, very important to myself and uh, the producers that I brought on. So <clears throat> that's the kind of place we were looking for. Alec gave me a call one day and said, hey, I found a place we can shoot Prelude, let's go see it. So uh, myself and Alec and two other people, uh, maybe three other people, drove down far, far away from Los Angeles to a place, gosh, I believe, it, I believe it was Victorville, California, which that won't mean anything to an Australian audience. But the think of, Matt, tell me a place that's far from Sydney that's really just, you wouldn't want to shoot there. <laughs> Like a neighborhood that's just like within the metro area of Sydney, beyond more the rural area. You're you're leaving Sydney now. You're you've gone beyond. You're 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 kind of out in the bush essentially. <laughs> There's a little town, a little town where. Well, you could probably go to the other side of the state. You know, somewhere like Broken Hill or, or something like that. <laughs> so this was a this was, yeah, this was about a, it's outside of Los Angeles, at, at least an hour outside of Los Angeles, and he had found a warehouse. This warehouse was a linen had been a linen supply. And he was thinking about leasing it to shoot Prelude. Well, I have photographs of it. If you want to see them, let me know. I took a bunch of photographs because it was not suitable for filming. It had no bathroom facility. It had uh, many parts of it were dirt floors or broke, cracked concrete floors. Uh, it had massive, massive work you'd have to do. It wasn't sufficient electrically for filming. You couldn't Put, you couldn't hang lights in this place. It was a linen supply warehouse. It was meant for collecting linen, washing linen, and then delivering linen back to the vent, to, back to the clients. And uh, <laughs> and I, I was the voice of dissent. I took a minority position that day. Alec was excited. He was very passionate, not to fault him, but he was very passionate about it. He saw how it could work. Uh, the other people were like, "Yeah, hey boss, if you want to do it, let's do it." And I took the minority position and said, "Alec, no." we cannot use this place. And I challenged him. And back then, when we were still close, he, was, he listened to me. He listened that the idea of taking that $100,000 we'd made for Prelude should not be spent on building a bathroom or bathroom facility here. And we can't, and we can't ask our actors of that caliber to be going in porta potties that would be dragged in uh, in this place. Uh, it, there, was no, there was no sufficient sinks for the makeup people to work with. It was a catastrophe waiting to happen. Thankfully, he listened to me and did not lease that space out there. And I challenged him and he took the challenge and he found some other place, which was much more suitable. It was in the Valencia area. And uh, unfortunately with that place, when we brought in the sound designer, very talented sound designer, he said, you guys, this is nice, it's great, it's fun. I see the advantages that you see, but for a sound guy, this is a nightmare waiting to happen. There's no way you're gonna deal with the, there's no way you're gonna fix the echo with this 50 foot ceiling will be, working against this in post, it'll be really, you know, it's just why work this way when there are, there are other ways to work. So <clears throat> that was the last draw for me. I, my friend did the legwork, found some fantastic sound stages in town that were plug and play. They were ready to go. This, they had great dressing rooms. Our actors were going to be shown that if they worked with us, they would be handled in, the, in a professional manner, that they wouldn't have to uh, be dragged out an hour out, an hour plus outside of Los Angeles for a bathroom that was, you know, a porta potty. Uh, they had their own bathrooms. They had it was comfortable. Uh, they could look down on stage. It was a fantastic, fantastic sound stage. Uh, out in uh, out in the middle of Hollywood, it was accessible to everyone. It was accessible to Gripen Electric. It, it had it was a sound stage and it had all the advantages that are implied by sound stage. And that's that's a huge part of Prelude's success was that we use professional sound stages. That that money ended up going toward that and directly on screen as opposed to creating from from a a, a, a built a fixer upper uh, and going from there. And the reason why I was so against doing major construction on a warehouse in at an, over an hour outside of Los Angeles was because that money should be going toward the special effects. It should be going toward Tobias Richter and his team in Germany. It should be going to the actors who were coming on. It should be going to wardrobe. It should be going on the screen, not toward construction, not toward fixing up a building. 
And again, it worked. Yeah, well, if you're not interested in using what you have and making do with, with what you've got, I, I guess that you're really sort of creating, well, morphing into creating a, a business and, and, a, and a studio model out of this. You're, you're trying to finance and, and fund and create something for more than just one production that's supposed to be um, cheap, um, very cheaply done. And it really is running before you're walking, isn't it? Definitely. And this is why I urge everyone to, after you finish listening to this, please go to the Engage podcast and listen to John Van Sitters and listen to the reasoned arguments in there. People have reacted to the guidelines saying, oh, well, I can't do this. What's going to happen to homegrown Trek? Well, the guidelines are the best thing possible for homegrown Trek. Do you want to make your own costumes? Of course you can make your own costumes. John says this. Um, yes, they'd prefer you use a Novos, but at the same time, if you have it in you to get together with your cosplay friends and build the crystalline entity, <laughs> do it. You know, there, it's such a reasoned, nuanced explanation of the guidelines at engage.com. And uh, yeah, that's what fan films are supposed to be about, using what you have, getting together with your friends, uh, and, and doing something great. My friends, the ones that Alec assembled, happen to be able to create epic fiction on less than an epic budget. That's what they do every day for their bread and butter, and we brought that to Prelude. But that shouldn't mean that other fans around the world should feel like they can't because they don't have that kind of access. And that's what the guidelines are about, protecting that. That was the biggest thing for me when I attempted a fan production, uh, a short-lived series called Eternal Night that eventually became an audio drama. Cool title. <laughs> Thank you. I just couldn't compete with Star Trek Continues or New Voyages and, and Hidden Frontier was really sort of my mantle. Mm. Um, but that's one thing that John Van Sitters and I have spoken uh, uh, behind the scenes and it's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to repeat. But um, the biggest thing that I said to him was that these guidelines really level the playing field uh, for people around the world who don't have access uh, to Trek veterans to be on their, on their podcast, uh, on their show. And I, I really do believe that these uh, th these new guidelines are, to, are designed to level the playing field, and, and I'm very excited by them as, as someone f as far removed from Hollywood uh, as I can be. And, and I guess that um, people are up in arms about this. Uh, if you can't tell a story in 15 or 30 minutes, then there's something, then there's something wrong with your script writing ability. Or even five, even five minutes. I mean, a good track story can be just three minutes you know a chess scene between spock and kirk is a great trek story uh, a, a few red shirts mourning for the guy that they just lost is a great trek story three to five minutes you could tell that in you know there are so many great trek stories that you can tell in that time uh and that's that's what is going to happen and that's fantastic another thing that's exciting for me is a lot of these really talented people have been making Trek fan films and that's been wonderful. And you know, it's great. That's been great preparation for them to do their own stuff. These are imaginative people who are inspired by Trek. And now we're going to see some really fun, original stuff. I don't know anybody that doesn't love fiction, that doesn't wish there was more original stuff out there. And we all love Trek. We all love Star Wars. We all love the thing, Harry Potter, the things we all love. But you know what? Take that imagination and boldly go where you haven't gone before and make something of your own. Uh, there's nothing like it. Well, that's a perfect tagline, Christian, uh, but I do want to come back to everybody's favorite producer. <laughs> sure. When I interviewed him, everything was hunky-dory and very cordial while the questions were about Axanar and how great it is and, and what he was hoping to achieve with all of this. But as soon as the questions turned uh, to things that he didn't want to talk about or didn't like answering or being asked, uh, things turned very sour very quickly and I was branded as a hater uh, and that's certainly what's flowed uh, ever since uh, in terms of from Axanar supporters. Uh, what was your experience like with him? Uh, that was, well, identical. Your experience, my experience, the experience of Vic Mignona, the experience of uh, so many people, and Terry McIntosh, who was a loyal workhorse for Alec Peters for years. Uh, I mean, to, you want to talk about one of the most valuable players in the success of that of, of what Alec was doing. You're talking about Terry McIntosh, just a tireless, selfless workhorse. And now he has been cast away with not, with not so much. It has to ask in public for a thank you, a simple thank you. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, this was my experience as well. 
I wasn't, uh, whereas before, I could stand up and say, Alec, for the sake of what we want to do here, it should be done this way. And I've done this before and you haven't, so please listen to that. <clears throat> that, was what, that was the good old days. Um, you know, we shouldn't shoot in a warehouse out over an hour outside of Los Angeles. Um, yes, there should be star dates in the script. Yes, there should be a beginning and a middle and an end <clears throat> to the story and not just basically endless monologues of, of Star Trek ship techno babble. And he listened to all these things. And sometimes we'd fight, we'd have a good scrap. That's what creativity is like. I mean, my goodness, a few days before we, uh, we filmed, uh, I made a, a, the final changes. Uh, as you do, to the script. And Alec and I had a huge row about it, but we compromised and we came and we stayed at the table and I wasn't branded a hater. And I wasn't, you know, kicked off and I wasn't blocked from websites. And he listened and you know what? Prelude happened. So that, that confrontation is part of creativity. But when you start blocking people from websites, when you start thinking you know better, when you, then people who are experienced and you're not, that's when bad things happen. I remember at Kamikaze, Rob and I, Rob was desperate because Rob really wanted this to go well. And we were talking, trying to help each other out as to how we could get Alec to understand that just like with the warehouse that we didn't shoot Prelude in, it was probably not that great an idea to get a warehouse now and convert it. And um, we, we sat there and, and talked about it. We were kind of stressed out. How can we convince him? He's just not listening to us. And we tried our best, and he did not listen. Um, and he, at we, Alec, Rob and I just had to shrug our shoulders and say, well, he's just going to do it his way. And that was the beginning of, that was the, beginning of the end, when, when I just wasn't being listened to anymore. And I had, uh, when he didn't want to take the advice, not only of myself, but of the other line producers who were very, very smart with that money and who kept very, very clear records of expenditure and made sure, and made sure that all the leads had what they needed, made sure that the makeup people had the materials to make those ears for Gary Graham that were so beautifully done that you could do an extreme close-up, an extreme, extreme close-up on those ears, and they hold up beautifully. Uh, the wardrobe people had what they needed. I mean, these, these were professional producers, and they did a great job with Prelude. And they quickly realized that on Axanar, once, that, once the Prelude had been released and once that big fortune had come in for a fan film, half a million, uh, that, that Alec was going to do things his way and that he felt because he had that money, he no longer needed to listen to the people who had made the film that had granted him that fortune in the first place. So uh, they left, and I watched this all happen. I watched these people kind of leave. I watched a couple of people get sacked in public. Some people not at all, just sacked without ever being contacted. And <clears throat> I just uh, got to a point where I realized, you know what, this isn't going to be... Um, this isn't going to be what I hoped it was. It's not going to live up to the promise that Prelude delivered. And uh, if I can't convince him anymore of the decisions that, that only a professional really knows to make, then, uh, then I need to go back to the professional realm. This has been fun. It's been a lark. Uh, but uh, he's going to have to do it on his own. He's going to have to learn those lessons the hard way. And, and I, was, I, was, I was treated as a traitor for that. Yeah, well, that's the biggest thing that I've found uh, doing Trek Zone for the last 13 years and these podcasts for the last three. Uh, it, it has to be fun and it can't be too stressful because um, you're in the industry already. You're doing all of this yourself, directing Prelude and, and being a, a, in the industry yourself. Um, I'm in the same boat, whereas um, you come home from your day off and you jump into, I jump into this studio and, and have a bit of fun and meet some amazing people. Uh, if it started becoming stressful and uh, eating up all of my time and, and taking all of my energy to deal with uh, all the rot, and if that was the case, it would no longer be enjoyable and, and you really wouldn't want to be doing it, would you, Christian? It's, and it's, it still is for everyone who's still involved with him. It's, it's uh, I would say, the, it, the fun, it's hard to have fun when people that donated tens of thousands of dollars, some of my friends donated, and, and some of them more than that, when those people are blocked from websites because they want explanations for where the money is and how much of it he has left when they're asking him simple questions as to where their perks are and they become branded as haters and traitors and blocked from websites well that's not very federation of him is it to 
uh, discourage dissent like that, that's, that's not very Federation at all. And so that's not fun. Well, as I said on the uh, J&T show, it's, it's very Cardassian of him, isn't it? It's very Cardassian, I have to say. Some Cardassian tactics going on in there. And that's not, uh, that's not what it was when we started. Well, Christian, we're fast running out of time, but I do want to also point out something that you have said uh, since you've started speaking out against Alec and, and Axanar is that if the feature-length movie was to ever be made, uh, it would not necessarily be of the same quality uh, as Prelude because everyone, pretty much everyone that worked on that uh, has, has left the project. <clears throat> there will be um, still amazing CG. As long as he has Tobias Richter and Lightworks, there will be amazing CG. Tobias is a gentleman, fantastic human being. And um, I'm happy to say we are still in communication. Uh, Alec likes to paint a portrait of us as, as uh, there being animosity between us, but there's not, I'm, I'm in touch with Tobias. Um, we work it out uh, on our own and we're in communication. I'm happy to report and I have nothing but praise for Tobias Richter. What he does with how little he's paid is phenomenal. You know, there are so many CG practitioners in the world. One of the things that the really great ones do is they have, uh, there's a style, there's a romance to their shots and that's, that's Tobias and his crew. They're phenomenal. And so there will be, even if, even if Alec were to do us all a favor and just release a bunch of Tobias Richter battle footage, I think that would be great. Um, as far as, uh, as far as the rest of the crew, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many people there are. I, I think I would encourage everyone to look at the crew list for Prelude and then, and then uh, look at the cr crew list for Axanar and make a comparison and see for yourself. Uh, a good amount of the crew are gone, uh, a majority. And because they came with the, they came when it was fun and uh, when there was something happening and when it went from a film production fan club brought together to shoot something very specific to a kind of let's build a warehouse uh, that was no longer what, what we were interested in so so we left and we didn't like the idea of our, of our colleagues being treated the way they were being treated being fired online for a fan film is you just don't do that that just goes beyond uh, the etiquette of a fan film you can do some crazy stuff in, in the professional realm it's kind of you know sure it's you know it's Thunderdome it's, it's, it's no holds barred combat in the professional realm but on a yeah, fan film exactly right yeah, I've, I've experienced that <laughs> in the fan film world, uh, you know, have some have some courtesy and some decency, um, you know, <clears throat> but this is the thing I, I encourage everyone listen. And again, speaking of the professionals, listen to people like Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton knows what he's talking about and he has no love for what's happening. So listen to what he has to say. And I assure you, having been there, having seen it with my own two eyes, having lived it for years, because don't forget that the prelude was years in the making. Alec and I were talking about this uh at least I have records going back to 2009, 2010, and we shot Prelude in 2014. So this is years of kind of going back and forth, talking about it, trying to make it happen. Uh, not just kind of, you know, dreaming it into reality. It's a long time. And uh, so the professionals know what they're talking about. There is a reticence for a reason. As I said on the GNT podcast, which again, I was, uh, had a really great time talking with uh, Mike and Nick, uh, you know, there's a reason why there's no Star Trek continues coffee. <laughs> there's a reason why the other people aren't putting out product. Fantastic, Christian. One last question. You and Rob Burnett, is there a friendship there? Oh, there is. Um, Rob, I'm so glad you bring that up, Matt, because Rob and I knew each other long before either of us met Alec. Rob and I were friends on the Starship Smackdown, Mark Altman's fantastic uh, show that ends San Diego Comic-Con. I can't wait to do it this year. I know Rob is still on the show, so... Uh, I can look forward to seeing him there and having a great time. And uh, yes, it's difficult for Rob because he, on the one hand, really wants to do a great job for the donors. But at the same time, he is, he is in a position where he can't really speak freely because he'll become branded as a traitor and a hater, <laughs> right? So, he ha so Alec speaks for him and he can't retort. I know for a fact that Alec is saying things that, that uh, are not true. He is lying, and Rob can't retort those lies because he'll be branded as a hater and a traitor. So I feel for Rob, and, uh, and I encourage him to uh, stay strong, and I'm still his friend. I encourage him and look forward to him realizing some things that many other people have realized and getting back to uh, professional filmmaking where he belongs. 
Yeah, well, the invitation still stands to Rob Burnett to come on the show and, and chat. And it really is, it's not about me uh, hating on anybody. It's about providing um, an opportunity to hear another side of the story. And that's really what I want Trexone to be. I don't want to be 100% against Dax and R with the people that I interview, but they're not giving me a lot of choice. And, and unfortunately, um, I will run with um, who I can get on the show and... Uh, but as I said, the invitation to Rob Burnett, if you are watching, it still stands, mate. Come on the show. Let's have a chat and um, let's not make it personal. Let's let's just have a chat about our differing opinions. Yeah, uh, Rob is a great guy. And uh, I I would it would be great if he would he would basically counter some of the lies that are being told about the way Prelude ended. But I understand why he can't right now, because, uh, you know, he'll be branded as a hater and a traitor. And <clears throat> as unfair as that is, uh, I can I can put myself in Rob's position. I was there once. I'm glad I am no longer. Fantastic, Christian. Thank you so much for your time, man. And uh, safe travels to LA. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. It's been a blast. Best of luck to you.